Welcome to Follow Him, a weekly podcast dedicated to helping individuals and families with their Come Follow Me study. I'm Hank Smith. And I'm John, by the way. We love to learn. We love to laugh. We want to learn and laugh with you. As together, we follow Him. Hello, my friends. Welcome to another episode of Follow Him. My name is Hank Smith. I am your host. I am here with my wise co-host, John, by the way. John, I was looking in section 109 and uh, the Lord says to seek out words of wisdom. And to me, mm. that's just the words of John, by the way. Oh, yeah. Words right, of yeah. wisdom. <laughs> like the old owl in Winnie the Pooh. Not the old owl. Just the owl. No, I think the old part, you got it right there. You are not old. You don't count as old. <laughs> what did you say, Hank? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, uh, we want to remind everybody that you can find us on social media. We would love for you to come find us on Facebook or on Instagram and make comments. We love to see what you have to say, especially if it's positive. Uh, you can <laughs> come to followhim.co, followhim.co for transcripts, quotes, references, all that you need. And of course, please take the time to rate and review the podcast. Uh, that actually helps us quite a bit. Um, John, we are on a seminal uh, two sections of the Doctrine and Covenants, huge sections of the Doctrine and yeah. Covenants. And so we had to get someone who could could live up to exactly. those sections. So tell us who's with us today. Yes, thank you. T today we have Dr. Brent M. Rogers. He's a historian and a documentary editor for the Joseph Smith Papers. And that right there tells you something. He earned a bachelor's degree with honors in history from San Diego State, a master's in public history from California State University, Sacramento, and a PhD with emphasis in 19th century United States history from the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. He's, he's been everywhere. Uh, he's the author of Listen to this title, A Distinction Between Mormons and Americans, Mormon Indian Missionaries, Federal Indian Policy, and the Utah War, wow. which was in the Utah Historical Quarterly. And Hank, he won the Western History Association's 2015 Arrington Prucha, is how you say that, a prize for best article on the history of religion in the West. And he's also a co-editor of the uh, Journals, Volume 3 of the Joseph Smith Papers and the Documents, Volume 3 of the Joseph Smith Papers. And so uh, when I, I just think the Joseph Smith Papers project has been amazing and so glad to have you here. Uh, Dr. Rogers, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you both for having me. It's, uh, it's an honor and, uh, you know, you guys know how to put people at ease just, you know, with your, your calm uh, calm approach. So thank you. Uh, Dr. Rogers comes highly recommended by his peers, Dr. Harper, uh, Dr. Dirk Mott all said that this is who we need to talk to for sections 109 and 110. And we've said before, John, on the podcast that when you're studying the, the doctrine and covenants and studying history, uh, we don't, I don't think you and I realized how much of a science history is and that you need to be trained in history. Yeah, there there comes a reliability when you know people are using the tools of of scholarship and uh, and you'll hear a precision in their language uh, when they describe things. And so that's a, a real wonderful thing we've had on this podcast is we have people that are acquainted with with those tools of scholarship and history and, and they'll separate an assumption from a. You know, and, and those kinds of things are, are great to have. So this has been wonderful. And they can be source critical, too. So, uh, Dr. Rogers, yeah. well, you're an all out historian. Did you always want to be a historian? No, I actually <laughs> I, I can't say that I really took a, a liking to the, the study of history until my sophomore year of college. Um, I was actually probably one of those, you know, kids in high school that thought history was boring and had, you know, uh, kind of a bad attitude about it. I, I remember, you know, taking some road trips as a child and uh, stopping along the way and seeing some historic markers and always thinking that that was kind of fun. But then uh, getting into history when you're when you're in school, it seems a lot more about 
rote memorization and and this date and this thing happened on that particular date and it's just a kind of a series of chronological events and and so i i can say for a certainty that i was not really into history uh, and i had to take a us history course my uh, second year of of college and i it's like well i'll take a you know an american history course it's one of the courses that you have to take to meet a requirement and and so we'll get it out of the way and um there was just something different about history uh, in really studying the the whys and um the motives and the decisions that were made uh, that that caused those critical events that happened and that dates get associated with. And so saw a little bit different dynamic to history as I studied it in in college. And particularly interesting to me was uh, was the people dynamic and and how people related to one another. And um, that was something that just seemed a little bit detached from from other you know, events, whether, or, uh, you know, other study that I had in high school and, you know, and just uh, going to markers, you know, there might be a name of, of somebody mentioned, but getting to know more about the, I guess, ordinary people um, was, was fascinating to me. Yeah, we're hoping to do uh, some of this dynamic uh, that you're talking about here, uh, Brent, uh, today. Let's jump into these sections. Sections uh, 109 and 110 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Um, it, uh, I don't think the importance of these two sections can be uh, overstated in the Doctrine and Covenants, right? Uh, this is huge. I've heard, uh, uh, I think it was Steve Harper say before that 1836 may well be the best year of Joseph Smith's life. Um, uh, so why don't you uh, take us as far back as you want to go uh, and tell our listeners what they need to know to get to lead what leads up to March 27th, 1836. Well, how much time do we have in the podcast? <laughs> uh, I think we could, I mean, really these, these are five years in the making at least. Um, if, if not, you can go, in fact, maybe I'll, I'll go back even further at some point, but uh, th these revelations that we're talking about today are sort of the culmination of, of the first five and a half, six years of, um, of the organization of the church. And then if you want to go back to, you know, when Joseph Smith saw God, the father and his son, Jesus Christ in, uh, in the sacred grove, you know, this, this is all building to, um, to these momentous days in late March and early April, 1836. And so this is where Joseph learns that, that, they would be endowed with power from on high, right? And that they were that's to, the that commandment is, to move, right? Yeah, at, at the Ohio, that's that's where they're going to be endowed with power from on high. Um, you know, we could jump, then jump forward to you know, Doctrine and Covenants eighty eight is um, talking about establishing the house, the house of prayer, the house of fasting, house of faith, um, house of learning, house of glory, a house of order. And house of God. And, and so there's, you know, we can move forward again to section 94 that, um, talks about laying out and preparing the foundation of the, the city of Zion, uh, city of the stake of Zion, excuse me. And he says, beginning at my house, this is means, you know, where, where we're going to build, uh, the temple. And that's that if we were to look at a plat of the central space of, the city of Zion and the city of the stake of Zion, uh, the temple is right in the middle. And it's from that space, that focal central space that the beauty and the power of the temple was going to be a beacon and radiate out to the, um, members of the church and be a constant reminder in their lives. This is part of the pattern that the, the Lord is, is giving. And so, um, you know, some of the words like order and, um, glory and prayer. And these are things that, that are building up to, um, to where we, we find ourselves in, um, spring of 1836. And one other section, maybe just a hint at here to start is, uh, section 95, uh, which I, I've long found to be a very fascinating, uh, section, but the, the part that the Lord says to, 
to Joseph and the saints that ye have sinned against me a very grievous sin in that ye have not considered the great commandment in all things that I have given unto you concerning the building of mine house for the preparation wherewith I designed to prepare mine apostles to prune the vineyard for the last time. Um, and so he's, there's two things that I think are really important about that part of the revelation. One is, uh, you know, it's, it's been through the winter and just a few months into 1833. And the Lord is like, why aren't you guys building that house that I commanded you to build in section 88? And like, you know, let's go. It's, it's time to get moving on that. Um, and the, just a few days later, Hiram Smith writes in his journal that, you know, they start digging out the, the trench, uh, and the, for the walls and, and they get going. I mean, they take the section 95 revelation pretty seriously. The saints do. And they, they really start, that's when work begins in earnest, um, on the, on the temple in Kirtland. I remember from an earlier, maybe when we were talking about section 95, wasn't Hiram the first one to throw a shovel into the ground or something and said he wanted to be the first and, yeah. Yeah. And no, and he, he goes and he grabs it and Im immediately begins digging mm -hmm. out those, uh, those areas for the foundation. And it's, yeah. it's pretty, um, pretty remarkable to see how quickly they respond to that, uh, physical act of getting the temple going. There's a great lesson there for me is, is sometimes, sometimes we want to wait until, we feel like we've got everything in place, right? We're going to, well, let's just wait a little bit longer and we'll get, you know, what about the windows? What about the roof? What about this? And Hiram Smith's, let's get started. <laughs> let's get started. Yeah. The Lord can start bringing people in. I've noticed that. And maybe we can talk about a little bit about this, Brent, as you, as you uh, prep us for 109. But it seems to me once they got started, the Lord started sending those who could do windows, who could do furniture, who could do plans, but they had to get started. Yeah, acting acting on that um, command, if you will, that revelation, that prompting, and and doing it, not maybe knowing where where it's going to go or how you're going to get some of those things accomplished, and um, those ways uh, come about because of the faith taken to get started. I think, yeah, I think that's a great point. Uh, the other point I wanted to make about that uh, line in section ninety five is about preparation. It says the the building of mine house for the preparation wherewith I designed to prepare. So you got preparation and then prepare these, you know, both in the same line of that uh, revelation. And it's, it's fascinating to me to see uh, how Joseph Smith goes about that preparation. Um, and, and so we'll fast forward into the fall of 1835, um, you know, in, in the, time between when they first start digging the, for the foundation walls in June of 1833 until the fall of, uh, 1835, quite a lot happens. You have, uh, Zion's camp, um, that expedition happens. And, and of course that's tied uh, to the temple as well. If, if you're reading in section, uh, 105, it, where it says that, you know, this isn't going to happen, the meaning the, you know, the, the taking over of Zion and, or taking back of, of Zion, excuse me. Um, but the elders needed first to be prepared and taught more perfectly and obtain that, that long promised endowment of power in the Kirtland temple. And so when they get back from Zion's camp, um, they, they go going all in on finishing the physical construction of the temple. And what Lucy Mack Smith writes about that time frame from 1835 through early 1836, she says there was but one mainspring to all of our thoughts. And she's talking about the church members, the saints. And she says, and that was building the Lord's house. And I think if we were to look at a lot of the, you know, of the sources of that time period, you would see that that's exactly, she's exactly right. That the, the mainspring to the thoughts of the saints is we need to finish building the the Lord's house. But the, so physical construction is one thing and then spiritual preparation is another. And that's where coming back to section 95, where, you know, the, the Lord says that he's going to prepare his apostles to, to prune the vineyard. Um, there's, there's a lot that happens with Joseph Smith's um, the, the direction that he takes with his teaching and, and counsel in late 1835 and into 1836, he really emphasizes spiritual preparation. He, he focuses on themes like unity and humility. Uh, there had been some 
disunity in the quorum of the 12 um, and and also between members of the 12 and the first presidency this stems from the the first mission of the as a quorum for the quorum of the 12 apostles um, there had been some reports that were sent back to to Kirtland um, that you know had some suggestions of the 12 weren't maybe doing what what uh, they were supposed to be doing um, and then there were letters written back from Kirtland to the 12 that, you know, took those uh, rumors or reports at face value. And, and there was upset feelings on, on both sides. Uh, now, they the, weren't far away, right, Brent? This was like an Eastern States mission. Is that correct? Yeah. In a lot of what I'm thinking about, it happened in New York, um, you know, kind of close to where the church was organized in um, upstate New York and Palmyra area. But um, yeah, they go to Maine and Massachusetts um, on that on that mission. And so the, well, part of the, the issue was the delay in communication that happens with letter writing in the 19th century. And so without a quick ability to, to send a text and say, hey, I think we got our, our lines crossed and, you know, uh, or, or to get on a video chat and, and clear the air, uh, this, this just kind of festered for um, the remainder of the mission for the 12. And then they return in September uh, and, and there's some pretty hurt feelings among members of the 12 and between the 12 and, and the first presidency. So they get called in February, leave on this mission in May, come back in September. And there's been some, some hurt feelings. There's been some, yeah, some hurt feelings that, um, that happen. And, there, there's an effort made uh, when they first return to try to clear the air, and it seems to have helped briefly. It doesn't last as as what you know happens sometimes with with humans, right? We we hold on to some feelings, and we're not totally ready. I'm just going to say, Brent, I'm I'm happy that this never happens in the church today. That there's yeah. no hurt feelings and wards and yeah, things We've fester. We've got it all and, figured out. Now. Yeah, I'm glad that that doesn't happen today. <laughs> it it definitely happens, and and that's okay. I think the the lesson maybe to learn as I keep talking through this is that um, you know if it doesn't if the forgiveness doesn't happen right away, that's all right. We just still got to work through it. Um, you know in so Joseph holds a, a meeting and he, uh, in October of 1835, and he tells the, the 12 apostles that, uh, that they must prepare their hearts in all humility if they're going to receive the endowment um, of power from on high. And so, again, you have that kind of that preparation is this real key word that, that kind of keeps coming up to get us to, um, to the temple. And I like how you're doing this. We've got the physical temple being built, but we, but. It's being prepared, but the spiritual, the, the people are also being built. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they they need to be just as ready as, you know, the, um, the plaster on the, the outside of the, the temple walls and those kind of things. Right. So the, the instruction continues in November where Joseph gives a discourse that he really is urging, uh, repentance and humility and preparation. He, um, he says, we must have all things prepared and call our solemn assembly as the Lord has commanded us that we may be able to accomplish this great work. And it must be done in God's own way. The house of the Lord must be prepared and the solemn assembly called and organized in it according to the order of the house of God. Um, and he says, and, and in it, meaning in the house of God, we must attend to the ordinance of washing the feet. So he's, he's uh, preparing them for that ordinance. And then he says, this is calculated to unite our hearts that we may be one in feeling and sentiment and that our faith may be strong so that Satan cannot overthrow us nor have any power over us. And so he, he then kind of, I don't know if this is the conclusion, but part of his um, continuing words on that November day was uh, all who are prepared uh, are, and are sufficiently pure to abide the presence of the Savior will see him. And, and in the solemn assembly to be held in the temple. And so I think that it's a very 
it's a strong teaching. It's a, it's a specific telling the, the 12, but also if we want to uh, say that he's teaching all of us that we need to be uh, united, we need to have unity. Um, and I think that has continuing relevance for us today. We need to have our hearts clean um, and, and be prepared so that Satan won't have power over us. And, and instead we'll be able to feel the presence of the, the savior manifest himself. And, um, that's particularly strong and, uh, in, in the temple, if we're able to, to go there with, um, clean hearts and to be prepared, to be prepared spiritually. The, the idea is that, that everyone has to look at themselves Right. Um, and that, that's that's not easy to do sometimes. It's I'd rather clean someone else's heart than my own. <laughs> do you know what I love about this, too, is, I mean, there's an expectation that he just created. It's almost like another um, one of his prophecies, because as we're going to find out at the dedication, there were amazing people saw amazing things. And he was right. If you are prepared, um, you may, you may see some incredible things, and and I just thinking, wow, that's that's kind of a prophecy in a way. Yeah, and and the the idea of of unity being so essential to um, to being ready to be able to see the the Savior, to be able to feel of His presence, uh, reminds me a lot of. Uh, Sister Eubanks talk that she gave, um, I think that was in 2020. It was one of my favorite talks from recent conferences where she, she talks about the need to create unity and to, to have mercy and to see differences, to be able to turn those to um, advantages and, and that unity takes work um, and that it sometimes can be uncomfortable. And I think that's kind of what Joseph was telling the, the members of the 12 and and if we want to extrapolate to, to us as well is that this is work it doesn't just you know you know just hear hey have unity with everybody and all of a sudden hey yep i'm unified let's go um it takes it takes work and i think what being you know unified or having unity means is um feeling unified in christ and through his teachings, he gives us the blueprint of how we become more unified and more kind and more loving um, as people. And and to Hank, to your point, um, you know how we can look inward to to clean ourselves up. You know, to um, he, he gives us that just as much as he does how to how to do that with other people. So I think that there is a real a, a real importance to thinking about spiritual preparation and unity. Um, as we think about this section 109, it's not necessarily, you know, if you were just to read the section, you wouldn't maybe see that, um, just in reading the verses, but knowing some of the background and some of the, the efforts that it took to get there, you can see how preparation and unity, spiritual preparation and, and being unified, um, is is essential to um to the dedication of the temple it's the definition of of zion right the one heart one mind thing it's all the same i wonder if having this project this building helps that you know i you would hope that as they're doing this together that that they're becoming i would think that they're becoming closer friends they're talking more they're communicating um but i just don't know which one was harder building the temple which is incredible right and we can we can talk a little bit about that brent the actual construction um or becoming unified i <laughs> i don't know <laughs> which one is going to be more difficult um yeah just because they're both tremendous tremendous uh projects <laughs> Well, yeah, let's see if we can I sort through that a little bit because um, th the physical construction of the, the temple was a huge challenge uh, yeah. from from getting supplies to uh, getting the right people, which we already sort of alluded to, um, to having enough, uh, you know, people and resources to to get it to get it constructed. And, uh, it, it took the sacrifice of a lot of, uh, people's time, money, um, 
you know, the, the cliche blood, sweat and tears, right? It, it took so much to just get that physical building done. Um, you know, it, it, I think that maybe if we're thinking about this from our present day lens, we think, you know, we hear, um, our beloved prophet talk about the building of, you know, several temples every time you know, a conference is announced. And it just seems like it's kind of a, you know, uh, everyday sort of thing now. Well, we, we have the means and we're just going to, you know, build new temples all over the world. And, and it's fantastic that we're in a position as a, as a church and an organization to be able to do that. We, we got to like look back on those early saints and know that one, they had, they had barely enough means to, to stay alive. Um, there, they don't have any of these modern conveniences of, you know, we'll, we'll just, uh, create an extra shipment of, uh, lumber this time around and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be okay. Um, there, there isn't that same ability to get, to get materials first of all, and to have uh, financial means. The, the early saints give every, scrap of, uh, extra, um, money or materials that they have to help, help do this. And so, you know, going back to Lucy Mac Smith's quote about there was one mainspring to all of our thoughts and that was building the Lord's house. Like they, they're, it's not just in their, their thoughts and we're going to go out and give the, the effort to do it. We're going to find ways to, to donate, um, any means that we have, you know, the several sisters are, are finding fabric to, to knit together or sew together so that they're, the veils are properly uh, done inside the temple. Um, and the curtains are properly done inside the temple to get the, you know, the wood to build all the pews that they had to build and not let alone the, the outside edifice. I mean, they're, they're scrapping together what they can and they end up creating this beautiful structure. And so that physical construction is, is, demanding and it's a major sacrifice. Um, but I, I would say, I think the spiritual is, is just as, if not harder. And I would say for us today, the spiritual, uh, is significantly harder. We have means to, to build and to do, um, physical work in a way that I think at least from my observations, you know, when, uh, when the ox is in the mire, uh, there's people that are going to, that are going to come running, and they're going to help. You know, we've had up in, up in where I live in Farmington, we've had some wind storms, um, you know, and some, some weather issues that have created some need for people to get out with some chainsaws and cut down some fallen trees and, and these kind of, and we have so many people that'll come out and, and help with that. And it's that project, having that project allows them to, to come out and there's a, they see there is a real need Sometimes I don't know if we see that same need, if there's a, you know, a leak in our spiritual dam or something like that. We, we kind of, uh, find ways just to, you know, paper it a little bit and, and then move on as the, the, the dam might crack a little bit more and more. Yeah. Or a grudge, a grudge is festering, right? Yeah. I don't know if we notice that as much. This is fascinating stuff. I mean, I've been to the Kirtland temple many times. And, uh, you're right. If you view it in 2021 20, standards, you're going, Oh, it's a nice, it's a nice building, right? That's great. But if you think of it for 1836, this had to be the biggest building within hundreds of miles. Yeah, it was. Um, they were thinking a log cabin at first. <laughs> and Joseph said, no, Joseph, gonna... you're going to build a house to the Lord out of logs. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to build yeah. something else. And the, the fact that they, that they did it is incredible, physically incredible. But the, the fact that they were able to come together as a group and unified, it's also equally uh, incredible. But I'm, I'm glad you're pointing this out, Brent. This is good stuff. Uh, thinking about um, just ordinary people that may have been of a number of different occupations or farmers because because today when president nelson might announce we're building more temples well i don't physically go there there's you know uh, it's contracted through the tithes or whatever but boy back then it was like whoever you are just come and start working <laughs> 
and whatever skills you have or don't have, we we need you. I, I think it's a really good point that now the spiritual preparation is probably harder because we're not expected to go start, you know, cutting logs or, or hewing stone out of the quarry like they like they were back then. Good point. I was living in the Sacramento area when uh, they were finishing construction on the Sacramento temple and there was an opportunity to help with some landscaping and, you know, that, that was an awesome thing. And I'm not trying to, to discount that, but you know, that, um, that, that was what was an opportunity or available for, for members of the church in the area to contribute to the temple is, is pretty small when you think about the other, work that it might take. But I mean, it was, it was a fulfilling uh, couple of hours to be able to help with some of the landscaping, but it, that was, that was all that was that, that we could do. And so it just kind of shows the the difference in what uh, the physical energy and sacrifice that, that, you know, that, that the early saints had to make. Yeah. I can imagine those Kirtland saints. Oh, you helped with the grass. Did you? Like, yeah. yeah, yeah, I helped with the grass. Oh, I actually <laughs> built the stairs, right? right? I mean, just, if I showed up at, John, if we showed up at the temple site today, they'd say, get away from here. You're going <laughs> to, you know. You're going to mess you, it up. Yeah, you're, you're going to mess it up. You're not building it to code. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the fact that the Kirtland Temple is still standing is a pretty incredible, pretty incredible yep. miracle, right? Um, it's still there. I mean, it's been almost 200 years and it is still there. That's a testament to them. It shows that that excellent uh, worksmanship that was done to, to right. construct that building for sure. And and then efforts of people along the way to make sure that it was kept up. And, and so we need to mm -hmm. acknowledge that as well. I think um, Sidney Rigdon, two and a half hours. Um, and we all know Sidney eventually, you know, fell away, but... I, I just don't know how well any of us would do had we been dragged by our heels with our head smacking against the cold ground, right? But I read something I had never heard before um, about uh, Sidney Rigdon. L listen to this. Heber C. Kimball said he, Sidney Rigdon, frequently used to go, used to go upon the walls of the building both by day and night, and frequently wetting the walls with his tears, crying aloud to the Almighty to send means whereby we might accomplish the building. I just love hearing that about Sidney, that uh, he was that invested, that he was weeping next to the walls of the partway constructed temple, asking for help to finish it. That's pretty cool. Have you heard that before? I hadn't. No, that is, that's wonderful. That is Times and Seasons, uh, 6, April 15th, 1845, page 867. That's in, you know, uh, Carl Anderson's book, uh, The Savior and Savior and Kirtland. But I just, I loved hearing that because I, I don't, I don't want us to only remember about Sydney that he eventually left. The first presidency uh, and members of the 12 have a meeting where they, they bring everybody together and uh, Oliver Cowdery is there as well. Uh, there's this meeting that's held in middle of January of 1836. It's January 16th um, because there are still kind of these lingering hard feelings. You know, uh, Joseph and his brother William, who's a member of the, the Quorum of the 12, had had a pretty a nasty fist fight that uh, left Joseph uh, unable to, you know, even sit up in his bed for, for a couple of days. Cause he, he'd been beaten so badly by his brother. And so there's still, still going to make mothers of sons feel a whole lot better when they hear <laughs> that Joseph Smith and his, his little brother, William got into a pretty big fist fight. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this we is... could get, we could get into that if if you want. I mean, it's it's kind of a kind of an aside, but there there was a, a verbal disagreement uh, in that led to a physical altercation, and and William apparently beat him pretty good. Yeah, uh, the idea was Joseph couldn't get his coat off, had his it, arm caught or something, right? And <laughs> well, that's what he said. If they're anything like my kids, you know, and you you observe the whole fight, you know, sometimes the one that comes out on the the end where maybe they they didn't do so well, they they have some some excuses. Uh, yeah. But no, I I'm this, not I'm not is, trying to besmirch <laughs> Joseph's character yeah, or anything. But this is uh, maybe something that we I like talking about this actually, Brent, because 
you know, William isn't mentioned all that often. You talk about Hiram and Joseph. We talk about Samuel. We talk about Alvin. Uh, but we don't mention William all that often. And it's because he was more of, he was difficult. He was a, a difficult member of the family. And I think for families out there, they might go, oh, right. That all families may have some difficulty. And, you know, the prophet and a member of the 12 got in a fist fight. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. William, I would say, you know, there's other people that know a lot more about, about William Smith, but I would say that I think that he was very human and he, um, you know, he kind of went with his, his feelings and, and passion, um, and, and in some cases went pretty hard with him. And, and I think that, you know, that's okay. He had a good heart and, uh, his, you know, his, relationship with his brothers was generally pretty good. Although, you know, there's, as is the case with a lot of families, you have, you have times when, um, the emotions run high and, and this was one of those, those times. And, um, it, it was hard on the family and, uh, you know, there was some reconciliation that was needed, but it might just be kind of a, a point to say it's a bit symbolic of there's, there's sort of this underlying tension. And if we want to put, take them outside of their roles as brothers and say, there's still an underlying tension between members of the first presidency and, and the quorum of the 12 apostles, it's, it's still there. And so they have this, they have this meeting in January to air the grievances and everybody who wants to speak gets a chance to speak. And there's, um, some pretty passionate talk that's, that's made. And, um, after all of the members of the, the 12 speak, Joseph, um, he he acknowledges that he he may have expressed some too harsh language at times and he he asks for forgiveness for hurting their feelings and it's it's interesting if you read the minutes of that meeting that's kind of all it took was his acknowledgement of of the um of the wrong and his sincere desire to to seek forgiveness and to forgive on his part and that's something that I mean, I, as I've studied Joseph Smith's life, I mean, his um, ability and desire to forgive and extend forgiveness is is quite remarkable to me. Um, and so, the, you know, the sounds like a big let's air out. <laughs> let's <laughs> let's talk about it. Right? Let, yeah, is, yeah. Wow, which takes uh, that's a lot of courage, and for the president of the church to apologize and say, "You know what? I'm sorry," and I like how you said this that that's what it took, and they that's that's a tribute to all of these men that they were able to forgive. Right, kind of see forward. a bigger picture about keeping keeping the temple and its blessings in their sights. We talked. I mean, just the the impression ever since section eighty eight, uh, and in those ninety sections, just how anxious the Lord was. Uh, the the sections in the some of the ninety sections ninety five about would you just build the temple? <laughs> the Lord just seems so anxious to give them the temple blessings. It's just a feeling that you get, and so it's it's good that they we've got to do what it takes, including forgiving and getting unified to make to get in a position where we get this done, not only the temple, but ourselves prepared for the temple. Yeah. And they, they exchange some uh, promises to each other and express confidence in one another. There's, there really seems to be a, a feeling of unity, unity in Christ and focusing on, on that kind of bigger picture that, that you alluded to John. And I mean, they, Joseph um, or, or the minutes of the meeting say that there was a perfect unison of feeling uh, on this occasion and our hearts overflowed. And that's, that's kind of how, how it ends. And then, um, why I think that that's such an important moment in getting us to, um, in getting us to the temple dedication is the things that happen as a result of that. Uh, it's just a week or days. I can't remember the exact time frame. Uh, about what, five days later that they're in, uh, the temple and doing the, um, the ritual washing and anointing for the first time, right? Doing the, um, the ordinance of, of washing and anointing in the, the manner that was shown by, um, Moses, right. Who stood, who, who, uh, who did that 
ordinance in ancient days. Um, and that after, after Joseph gets the, this ordinance done, he is being blessed by his father and, and other church leaders are, are there. And this is when, you know, section 137 is, is revealed and he has the vision of, of the celestial kingdom, the individuals that would dwell therein. And so I know you, this is not for our, uh, our time here, but that, that happens in the temple as they've become unified in, in their feelings with, with one another. And they are, uh, in a place of spiritual preparation. So it, it, in the chronology of events, it happens, uh, before the dedication of the temple, but we, we read it as section 137, which is, which is down the road, um, a little bit, but right. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at the date. Yeah, you said this meeting was January 16th, and here it is, January 21st, 1836. I, I, I didn't know that it was just after this big reconciliation uh, that this vision opens up. That's beautiful. Yeah, and, and of course, that, I mean, we all, um, you know, appreciate what is what is taught in this about, you know, um, especially as it pertained to Joseph Smith's family with, uh, with Alvin and all, all who have died without a knowledge of the gospel, who had received it, who would have received it if they had been permitted to, to remain on the earth will be heirs in the celestial kingdom. And that's, that's beautiful. And that's something that, that is, um, you know, answers a lot of questions yeah. for, for us it's like theological dynamite that's amazing to right. have that to have that the lord knows how to judge hearts and those who would have received it and so 137 was given before 109 and 110 what we're studying today and it was after yeah after a meeting where they got that feeling of unity there was some forgiveness some promises made to each other and and that's when that revelation came. That's a, that's great. Yeah. And now I can't say that, you know, that's the, the cause and effect, but the timing of it. But it was um, after that. Yeah. Yeah. That, that it comes after that. You know, there's, I, I think that there's something to that as Joseph is continually teaching about preparation mm -hmm. and unity and humility. And that after they have that airing of grievances that, that they're there and that, I think that it shows that they really are there and they really are in that place of spiritual preparation. Um, and that this is when, um, the, the vision of the celestial kingdom is, is shown to Joseph. You know, what's interesting about all of this is, um, I'm sure this experience has happened with both of you, but ha having been to dozens of youth conferences, I can remember more than once having a, just very fine testimony meetings and for kids getting up and really a Zion feeling kind of coming in and kids saying to each other, if I've ever offended you, if I've ever offended anybody here, I'm sorry. And uh, because there was such a wonderful spirit there and, and uh, that I've always thought of that as kind of a Zion feeling, one heart, one mind. And, and while even in your own ward, you go through ups and downs with people, but there's this feeling of, I just want a clean slate with all of you. If I've ever offended anyone, I, I'm sorry. And, and that proceeds. I, I love that idea. I, I, I wish we'd have those kind of Zion moments more often. It's what the, the kind of the influence of the spirit, it's what it does to you. And I, I, I personally, and, and Brent, you can't say that obviously there's cause and effect here, but I love that William and Joseph have this falling out. They reconcile and then there's Alvin, right, in the vision, almost as if that, you know, the the family was able to connect with him through the, the reconciliation with each other. I just, I think that's a beautiful idea. Yeah, I I like I like that as well. I never thought about it like that. And, and that, that makes, you know, it gives me the feels. That's, uh, that's, yeah. I like that. One of the think of, of, think of the word of, of, uh, I, somebody pointed this out the other day, a family reunion. We're, we're a union, unity. It's a re, we were reuniting, uh, for the family reunion. And that was a little reunion there. See their brother there must have been, uh, so huge for, for them. And I, and I suppose just kind of an understanding of, um, well, I guess if you didn't get baptized in this life, you know, sorry. 
But there he was. Yeah. Yeah. The evening before the dedication, March 26th, uh, Joseph and Oliver Cowdery, Sidney Rigdon, um, Warren Parrish, and I think Oliver Cowdery's brother, Warren Cowdery, is there as well. But they meet in the attic floor of the temple in, in what was called the president's room to, um, to prepare for the dedicatory event. And um, while there's not a whole lot known about, you know, the, the, that preparation outside of the fact that, that, you know, Joseph says that the prayer was revealed to him. Oliver Cowdery wrote in his uh, diary that, that at the meeting, he assisted in writing the prayer for the dedication of the house. And so what that means exactly, I, I don't know um, if he acted as scribe and wrote it as, as Joseph spoke as a possibility. Um, but it, it's, it's kind of an interesting phrasing of says assisted in writing a uh, prayer for the dedication of the house. And so, but it's, it's a, a revealed inspired um, prayer and the the men in that room decided that they wanted to have you know uh, have it printed and so they put together all the type and and get printed off a broadside you know a big sheet of paper so that Joseph has a nice printed uh, sheet to to read the prayer from um, the next day and so this is, this is a lot of work to do yeah and, I mean are you talking like setting type that kind of printing it, like that's that kind of printing wow wow. This is a long section too. It's it's quite long. Minding yeah. your P's and Q's and all that stuff and setting yeah. type. This is a lot of work. So wow. so that was a lot of work for them to do that. And then the next, obviously the next morning is a Sunday morning, um, March 27th. And, you know, the, the saints are so excited about this event and they, they rush to the, the temple before the, the doors even open. And there, there are throngs there that are, um, that are waiting to get in. There are some that, that go to a, a secondary location that, you know, I guess was, they were still able to hear. And then others, I mean, there was such, um, such interest in it that they, they actually decided later to hold a second dedicatory event so that people could, you know, hear, hear the, the prayer read uh, out loud again. But it wasn't just the, the prayer that happened. Um, it, but there's, you know, Sidney Rigdon um, starts the meeting at nine in the morning, gives some uh, preliminary remarks. And then there's a hymn and then, and then Rigdon, you know, he, he holds forth for <laughs> two, two and a half hours. <laughs> I mean, he just, he just goes, just keeps talking, just keeps <laughs> talking. From the saints book. I just loved this kind of personal uh, someone, uh, Lydia Knight, this is on page 235 of Saints Volume 1. From her seat, Lydia could watch church leaders take their places behind the three rows of ornately carved pulpits at both ends of the room. In front of her on the west end of the building were pulpits for the first presidency and other leaders in the Melchizedek priesthood. Behind her along the east wall were pulpits for the bishoprics and Aaronic priesthood leaders. As a member of the Missouri High Council, Newell sat in a row of box seats behind these pulpits. As she waited for the dedication to begin, Lydia could also admire the beautiful woodwork along the pulpits and the row of tall columns that ran the length of the room. It was still early in the morning and sunlight poured into the court through the tall windows along the side walls. Overhead hung large canvas curtains, which could be rolled down between the pews to divide the space into temporary rooms. When the ushers could squeeze no one else into the room, Joseph stood and apologized to those who were unable to find a place to sit. He suggested holding an overflow meeting in the nearby schoolroom in the first floor of the print shop. A few minutes later, the, after the congregation settled into their seats, Sidney opened the service and spoke with great force for more than two hours. After a brief intermission, during which almost everyone in the congregation stayed oh, seated, wonderful. Joseph stood and offered the dedicatory prayer, which he had prepared with the help of Oliver and Sidney the day before. As you were saying, Brent, they have been looking forward to this. This has been a lot of time, a lot of sacrifice. Now, here's the question I have. Okay, we're going to hold an overflow. Okay, what are they going to do? Pipe sound over there? What <laughs> Are they going to run notes like King Benjamin's speech or something? How are they going to do that? It's the, that's a, I, I don't know. There are no... Uh, uh, no records that I've seen that speak to how that was to be held. Yeah, I, I don't, how do you do I don't an know. overflow back then? <laughs> <laughs> 
someone's writing it down and someone's pretending to be Joseph Smith in the overflow. And just five minutes later, he's reading <laughs> what was written. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> One thing that we can try to do more is, is encourage and share the voices of um, the sisters that we don't always get to hear. But um, this is this is a, an aside story. But I had a, one of my colleagues tell me that I had to share this, and I I agree. It's 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 kind of a, a good story. So, and I think it starts with the importance that the saints placed on attending the dedicatory event and wanting to be there for the dedication. Uh, so this the story goes, and this is according to writings from. Uh, two Latter-day Saints, one's named uh, Benjamin Brown, and then the other is one that uh, I'm sure our listeners probably know a little bit better, but her name is Eliza R. Snow. Um, they they both write these accounts that talk about an, an unnamed woman. They don't, they don't mention a name. Um, but at least the Benjamin Brown writing of this like is is just days, if maybe weeks after the dedication. And so, you know, there's... and that there's corroborating stories suggest that, that, that something along these lines happen, right? But this unnamed woman could not find anyone to leave her two month old child with. Um, she really wanted to attend the dedication, but everybody that she knew that would watch the child was also going to the dedication. And so there were temple rules that had been created that prohibited children from assembling in the temple in times of worship. And so as there was nobody that she either could or felt comfortable with leaving her, her child with, she takes this two month old, um, to the temple that morning. And some of the doorkeepers that were there turned her away, you know, citing the, the rules. Um, but Joseph Smith senior was apparently also one of the doorkeepers and she approached him and implored him and said, please, I mean, I'm, I'm filling in the words here, but she said something like, please, I, I want to be here. Let me, uh, my, my, my baby will, I'll take care of the baby. That won't be a distraction. And he, she asked to allow her and her baby to enter, uh, the house of the Lord. And so Joseph Smith senior, uh, reportedly said to, the doorkeepers that were at, at this particular door it said, uh, quote, brethren, we do not exercise faith. My faith is this child will not cry a word in the house today. And according to, to Benjamin Brown's account of, of summarizing what happened next, he wrote that after this, uh, you know, declaration by Joseph Smith Sr., the the woman and her child were admitted and uh, the child did not cry. This is, this is Benjamin Brown's uh, writings. The child did not cry a word from eight till four in the afternoon. And this is the part that uh, my, eight my hours. colleagues and I <laughs> especially, especially find um, fascinating. We'll say uh, when the saints all shouted Hosanna, the child was nursing, but let go and shouted also when the saints paused, it paused. When they shouted, it shouted for three times. When they shouted, amen, it shouted also for three times. Then it resumed its nursing without any alarm. And so it's kind of like, I mean, a, sort of a miracle. I, I like this story for a lot of reasons. I, I, and mostly I think it's the demonstration of the faith, both on the part of the woman who felt so strongly to attend the, the dedication and uh, Joseph Smith Sr., who who said, you know, we, hey, let's I, uh, let's exercise faith, and and he has the faith that the child would not cry a word. And um, according to this account, the the child only made a noise w during the Hosanna shout, and that's pretty 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 incredible story. Um, and and really just speaks to the the priority and that that woman placed on attending the the dedication and the the spirit that she would feel there and and just faith and anyway yeah, I just like that story. It's a great story. Yeah, we don't expect any mother who's listening to have perfectly quiet children. I know. I'm going. I should have had a lot more faith in yeah, a, I should have had a lot couple of hundred sacrament meetings because my kids yeah. couldn't go forty minutes, not four hours. Well, I used to pinch him to make him cry, so I could <laughs> I could go out with him. I used to go. We called it the uh, the the branch in the foyer. I'd be out there with three or four of the other elders circling in strollers. You know, the dad dance. You know, the bouncing. Yeah. The dad yeah. Dance. 
fortunately, we we don't have those. Uh, you know, that we've we've lightened up the rules in uh, yeah, times of worship. You, you know, ahead. having <laughs> having children around is a good thing in times of worship. Now, uh, <laughs> that's mm. true. Please join us for part two of this podcast.